great pleasure that I introduce John Pursley, whose book, If You Have Ghosts, was winner of the Zone 3 Editor's Prize for Poetry. In addition to this full-length collection of poems, John is the author of four chapbooks, including The Story Without Poverty. A recent winner of the Few Poetry Prize, the Southeast Review Poetry Prize, and the Sarah Lawrence College Campbell Corner Poetry Prize, his poems have appeared in Anyi, Colorado Review, and Poetry, among other journals. Of his work, Beth Ann Fennelly writes, emphatically felt, played out in a deep, nuanced syntax, these poems both reveal and complicate our troubled, troubling world. Joel Brown writes, like a latter-day old master, Pursley uses meticulous formal techniques to conjure vast and lavish landscapes in which you're glad to lose yourself. And David, David Wojohn says, John's striking debut is a collection of meticulously orchestrated lyric meditations, very confident in its music. We are proud to be the university and the press that published John's fine book, and we are so pleased to have him come today from Clemson University, where, he, where John teaches and read his work. Thank you very much. Please welcome John Person. Perhaps I'll start with a new poem. Then you to the book, and then go back to new poems. Um, but this new book that I'm working on is uh, loosely based around Christopher Columbus and sort of the sort of the illusion of what is the world we live in, I guess. And I really focused it on sort of my childhood and sort of demystifying the idea of what is America. Um, I'm not going to read any of those poems from it. Uh, maybe a little smidgen of that will show up. But several of the poems deal uh, directly with sort of the facts of that. I've been reading way too many Explorer journals and et cetera. But it's really exciting to me. But some of that's a little tedious in the reading. So I'm going to stay away from those poems and read some of the others that are sort of linking poems within it. But without further ado, I'll stop talking and I'm going to read these poems. These poems, um, there's really no good way to show you. But uh, I made them so that all the lines are the exact same length. Um, which was stupid. Actually, I had a teacher that said, this is the dumbest idea that I've ever seen. Stop doing it. And so I said, I'm going to write a whole book of these. Um, so they are all the same length lines, and they don't have titles. But uh, here it goes. Uh, so. Oh, I'm going to give them titles so that you guys sort of know that I'm in between poems. But, uh, the psychic says, this is your fortune. The psychic says, this is your fortune. She is old and overly apologetic as you enter through the beaded curtain of her house on the outskirts of the city, a rush of highway traffic still present in the ears. What you want is not quite clear, but what you have is money, an Italian leather handbag and a sinus headache. And by all accounts, it is almost summer. The microspores of pollen lining everything like a dusting of fine flour an immaculate green, carpet bombing the April air like a B-17 flying fortress over Germany. The B-24, 36, 47, 52. What you want is specious and spectacular, revivified in the closed caption of a stranger's home. That old dog that rises and moseys forward, the marionette of her former self, all sinew, Ligature, tendon string, and wire. The moleskin shoes and piles of newspapers, unread in the entryway. A water bowl, a yellow pear. By voice alone, she is motioning you through the foyer. A conduit, sun-spotted, angelic, she is motion motioning you through. There is a dog, jack hinged in the doorway, the scent of geranium a single pair, fear death by water. The room is dark and governed by shadows. Okay. Nothing to do with poems. This is my little side poem. Uh, so now I'm going to read from this story. Uh, and I'm just going to sort of move on around here. Get a couple of these. I'm going to read this first poem that's in the book, which is called Misappropriation. Um, when I was writing this poem, I was living in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm feeling like uh, yeah, the whole world was sort of 
closing down over me, and then I realized I was feeling sorry for myself again. <laughs> Misappropriation. A wood thrush hustles leaves from one side to the next, thinking about as much noise as a bird can make without using her voice. It's a game of chance and the time-honored tradition of mealworm and grub, a game she'll win given the persistence and the long curve of her beak, which cuts through all the bureaucratic bullshit of being a bird, the half-forgotten myths of punctuality and stasis, the sky charts, flow, all the go-betweens and middlemen pushing the anachronistic acorn of last year's crop, gearing up and gearing up and getting right to the point, which is or isn't about the food itself, about dignity and its misappropriation, and or glory be to God, the food is good. And standing at the window of the kitchen, leaning on the counter, where I have placed my mail, my electric bill and the credit card that I can't pay, where the cigarettes still smolder, shimmying up from an old ashtray, fashioned to look like the woman my father says I'll never meet. She seems beautiful and wise, strutting as she is among so many leaves, tossing them up and tossing them up, the tight wedge of her head working a line through dirt and dead weed, my meager attempts at growing grass, an art not quite confectionary, not quite Martha's Vineyard, though the amaryllis has begun to bloom along the fence row, pea vines and wild roses, and the red bud blossoms have given birth to bees, a thrush's voice, the melodious, the melodious pit, 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 rising from the azaleas, a silence stammering and rifled with leaves. Thoreau said once of the wood thrush, whenever a man hears it, he is young. It is a new country, new world, and a free country, and the gates of heaven are not shut against him. But to my lips, the bread is dry and I am happier when we do not speak of trivialities, all the days whitewashed with what is to come, nothing but the sun and the motion of our bodies, toweling off or tasting a word from the morning's paper, as you are tasting them now. And I am reminded it is the unremarkable that will last, the dry rustle of leaves and the garbage I forgot to put out, the last half of a sandwich you'll keep offering me as if I were a child Take it. It's yours to keep. So there's that. This next poem. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I have an aunt who lives in uh, Pompano Beach, Florida, which is just south of uh, Fort Lauderdale. So I spent many, many spring breaks, and any time we could get down to Florida, that's where we went. And, uh, it's sort of about that. Uh, I have a twin sister. Uh, you know, I didn't get into poetry the direct route. I went to school to be a marine biologist. And, uh, somehow, it's a bad choice. Yeah, I screwed up. I don't know. Anyway, I have a twin sister who's an accountant. So yeah, we're kind of kind of rule of both sides of that brain go. Maybe that's why the lines are perfectly straight on those. So. Anyway, hammerhead on the Atlantic. On the Fort Lauderdale docks, there are barrels set among the moorings. Fish crates and coolers of snapper, mahi-mahi, barracuda and bluefin. Marlins suspended from ready-made mounts, showcasing each catch. White fish and grouper, redfish and snook, a jewfish, a flounder, cobias and jacks, a triggerfish, rudderfish, look down and drum. A canvas of pure color, stippled in the long lines of waterfront, and so many boats bumping against the pilings, buckets of mullet, porgy and scad, moharas, tarpon, trout, and wahoo, silver king, kingfish, pigfish, ladyfish and fantails, ballyhoo and blue runner, pompano, scamp, all sprawled out in a little smorgasbord of heaven. All a 13-year-old's eyes can eat, and for nothing more than the abashment of parents and sisters asking too many questions, offering position, rank, and stature to our touristness. I feel stupid and contagious. Might as well hold up our signs, might as well enunciate mid, west, burn, 
then turn and spit into the ocean. <laughs> but in the high courts of fishermen, of fisheries in the great Atlantic, our case is not so simple. And most of the fish are big enough to break through bones, snap them in like cheese straws. And if the hammerhead hanging from the way scale offers anything, it is only to say, you better watch your ass, because the next life is only water, and current implies direction. So I'll lay down my pitchfork and step down off this tractor. Let the hay fly, the old engine knock the still. Besides, my, sister's is, my sister is kicking pennies, dimes, anything that glitters and might draw a tourist's attention, stuccoed along the docks. The afternoon charters, outriggings and sails, waiting for reservations, men with money. And the sky is a blaze of morning, and the brine that is the air says we are alive, and we are alive, let the water say the blessing. Here's another Tuscaloosa poem. I have a lot of Tuscaloosa poems. I was there for seven years, so um, it sort of gets in your blood eventually. Yeah. Roll tide. <laughs> Don't let my Clemson family know that. Right? Neat sonata for piano and pistol. It's hard to say what might happen next, the fall coming on. So many black umbrellas being snapped into shape under the broad boughs of the live oaks. Hard to know where to begin to begin with October's slow drudge upon us now. Sogging up our shoes while water pools along the roads, gutters on coffee cups, flyers in the rumples of old newspapers. In the, mar in the magnolias, the droplets <coughs> narrow, cut cross like capillaries, fall from stem to leaf to leaf. All along the road, the scattering of plastic flags and people parting ways. Cars in the slow procession of halogen stripes pass back and forth and back again. As if the waiting is the hardest part, the waiting and not knowing where to begin or what to do, where to eat, Italian or Mexican. Why this constant rain, this constant drizzle? What to say to the man in the corner singing God bless America and meaning it? Uh, I keep thinking one day I'm gonna write, I'm gonna start writing really funny poems, but I am yet to get there. <laughs> I started writing, when I started writing poems, uh, I, the reason I switched from marine biology, I was I, love, I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau, I still do. I think eventually I'll write a book about Jacques Cousteau. But, uh, um, but uh, uh, the reason I switched is I took my first poetry class, as some of you guys are probably doing here. I took my first poetry class and my teacher gave it back to me and he had written on it. This is the worst poem that I've read in 10 years. And uh, I cried a bit. <laughs> and then I went and talked to him and cried some more. <laughs> and then I decided, Rex West. Well, one day I'll meet this guy again. His name's Rex West. Florida State, man. I'm, I'm looking for him. <laughs> so I've changed my whole career and said, by God, I will be a poet. I'll be a better poet than Rex West. One day he will really be in the audience and I'll be embarrassed. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. According to Google, he doesn't exist. <laughs> and I have been stalking him. Yeah. I don't know how many years ago that was, but a long time. One, I'm going to read one more poem out of this. This is a rather long one. It has a couple sections. Um, called it a, a conventional weather. <coughs> I had this, some crazy neighbors that were next to me, and I, I, I decided that I hated them so much that perhaps I should like think of it in a totally different way. And I so I invented this like, whole sort of scenario, what, what was actually going on as opposed to what I was thinking went on. A conventional weather. <coughs> the water in the bath is still, and there is a silence about the room which you will not rise to. The way is gone again, and she is alone. The busted bicycle still leans against the tool shed. Handlebars rusted the color of clay, though not enough to suggest that this is Alabama. To say nothing of the coming night, the distance between our homes, the hollow pitch of gravel against the wheel wells as he pulls away, none of which would console or cure us. We are absolved of nothing, abstaining from nothing exchange few words, speak when spoken to.
Everyone is lonesome. It's all right, you can say it here. You can say I do not want to believe. But it isn't in the demarcations, the camisoles like curtains drawn tight about the body that we cover our nakedness. It isn't in the gardenia votive she's lit or in the two cut iris she'll leave too long in the window. The little things, my grandmother would say, the creature comforts, which are only enough to know what isn't there, which is him, which is everything. Self-conscious as we are, to watch and be watched, to speak for those who don't acknowledge us or wish to be acknowledged. These things, too, will pass. What she remembers, folded flat, pressed in origami doves, the improvised hand of a father fumbling to find what he cannot say, as if to stop time or take back a name. The rote coffee and cigarettes lithe upon the throat and rising what she remembers as from a great height, the rush and whir, the scatter of pigeons through the window, which by now must hold the heat of his coffee, the heaviness of voice, the single pebble of sand which beveled the glass to a point of weakness, the rush and whir, the pigeons he'd imagined to be doves, taking flight, lifting, just then, up and out, the air around his head darkening, the sky changing shape all at once. Had she been older, she might have comforted him. She might have cradled his neck against her own and held him there in the affectionate posture of a mother, or at least have turned to look at him. As it was, she did not and continued sweeping, each stroke issuing across the tile, a sound like expensive paper being torn from the backs of old books no one cared to read, in which a fire kindling ignited easily. In a way so habitual, it seemed less a duty of childhood than a childish attempt not to succumb to the slow assimilation of time. The cold partitions, chimeras, between what is real and what we come to believe. Because the story never changes once the wheels are set to motion. And death, as in all stories, takes its center and consecrates a beginning. There is no unending, no asters or tulips for cars to pass and grant their shape. Or I'm saying, such is the way of windows, of gravity and rock, conventional weather. The truth is, the water is warmer than she would like, and between here and there is mostly wasted space, an empty driveway that no one uses a 50-year-old pecan tree that produces no fruit, dropping dry limbs at the mere suggestion of rain. Mostly, there is quiet in the absence of quiet, an occasional car in passing, or mockingbird among bamboo. Mostly, we do not speak, and the truth is, at this distance, I can see only enough to know that she has drawn a bath, and, if anything, appears disinterested lost in the light above her head, in the soft dissonance of that music. It is a language strange to her, as if spoken too quickly, from an uh, airport payphone, a terminal busy with passengers, boarding and unboarding, so many voices, the almost indiscernible screams of children, of tires touching down, of rubber and steel, the quick click of a woman in heels, now slowing, now passing away, the luggage wheels and the wheels of strollers, whirring of dirt and dust, the microfibers of a boy's brown coat being dragged across the floor. And a woman is crying. In the arms of her mother, a girl, too big to be carried, drops a lollipop. Uh, too big to be carried, drops a lollipop. And on impact, exploding in a confusion of ruby shards, it sounds, in fact, more exquisite than it is. And though the child seems not to care, and more than a little bored by it, for a moment all sound stops. The escalator jams, the striders and laggards alike, and nothing. Only a man clearing the tunnel from LaGuardia or Newark, scanning the room, his thick wool suit too warm for the weather, working his way towards the arms of his wife, who's prepared dinner with candles, salmon sautéed in fresh chilies and limes, her hands rife with vinegar and a low-cost lotion, the fragrance of tea trees, her arms 
extended as if she were swimming, and then nothing, only the awkwardness of reunion, the sweet smell of candy, and water, water, everything. <coughs> Saturday night specials kids could carry for the rest of their lives. And why not? The SD's rocketeers are rifling toilet paper tubes at the moon, their payloads packed with living cargo, a praying mantis, June bugs and Japanese beetles, little dagamas and cooks, cartiers ready to raise the white flag, break bread and start staking their claims. And with little or no say in the matters of home, what would you expect a child to do? Even our own government shows no shame, pilfering the inside secrets behind x-ray glasses, their invisible inks and whoopee cushions, like so many exploding cigarettes. Just walk away. Is that your answer? Please, Doc. I did get sent to a shrink on other kid, a violent little sucker. <laughs> <laughs> I have things to change. Okay, last one. This, this, little, this three pages, but I'll go quick. And this one's got a couple moments of funniness, I think. So you guys might remember this from your high school days. Uh, high school, 101. No title again, because no title. A grape ensconced between cheek and gum. A grape ensconced between cheek and gum, the young lieutenant drags the heels of his well-made shoes, dividing our history class into nearly perfect rectangles. It is the kind of geometric formula Pythagoras would have enjoyed, but utilized in such a way Hitler even in the late domestic days, would applaud. No one is fooled, especially with the girls gone to a seminar on STDs and the ero and erroneous fallacies of original sin, and so much testosterone in the classroom. I am thinking of Eve straddling the hood of a 68 Dodge Charger and taking it from behind. I am thinking goose step and 42 minutes until lunch. I am thinking well-made shoes, the Rolling Stones, exile, in mono. I am thinking, I hate myself and want to die. There is a woman on the road pushing a shopping cart what looks like used clothes ransacked from the Salvation Army bins behind the Trinitarian Church. And she is laughing at something that may or may not exist. She is laughing as if the bird beside her now has told a joke about memory and desire in a language that promises nothing. She is laughing and mopping her forehead with her shirt sleeves. She is the bird woman, our resident lunatic of the city street. In the rafters, the sparrows are trying at speech, their mouths too full of song, the theory of song, too many notes, but the acoustics are good. She doesn't stop, she never stops. And we all pretend to be busy, pretend not to no notice the obvious pandering to an audience with no prospects but to listen. I think of sex and how little I know how behind the gym the freshmen are smoking, hiding from Mrs. Steinbeck, who is also smoking. <laughs> how the janitor looks busy. No one is fooled, and no one repels from the building or carries an assault rifle. No one drives tanks or jumps from an airplane. No one cares. We're only killing time until the next big thing, which looks a little like lunch. Salisbury steak and scalloped potatoes, green beans or cut corn. Of pie. 
But I am, but I am wrong. I am not dying. And for the next couple of minutes, I just want the angel in the first row, across the hall and two grades above me, to continue writing whatever it is, whatever it is she's writing. I want the young lieutenant to be the long distance runner I remember as a child of the third grade. His hair foppish and wild with wind, a congress of frictions and the disciplined motions of muscle, taut like pistons firing, like God. And if he drags his foot, he drags it with reason. I know, but I hate to see him crippled up this way, so humbled by the world, and for the third time today repeating the familiar mantras, faith, honor, courage, Uncle Sam needs us. If not now, then when? Johnny Kaczynski is holding a pen his pencil unconsciously like a revolver, and Brian Carmichael is writing Shaka Zulu down his right forearm in permanent marker believing it will bring providence to tonight's game. Stevie Weimer is asleep, as he is always asleep. Outside, the bird woman keeps navigating for a home I have never seen. A carpenter bee keeps bouncing against the window. I am thinking the sun is a star. I am thinking pounds per square inch, thinking stress back fractures. I am thinking how the grapes in the young lieutenant's cheek make him appear less human. How almost chipmunk, how squirrel, how adaptable the grapes must be to find their own organizing principles. <coughs> How like planetary systems, like quadrants of stars. How, when one of the grapes rolls off our teacher's desk, someone should yell grenade and dive to the floor. <laughs> How no one does. I am thinking of a dog yapping across the street, what he might be saying. I am thinking Columbus, three ships and so much ocean. I am thinking deserted streets and the laughter of children. Thinking of Eve, the garden, a good rain. How good it feels to hold hands. How like thunder, the report of a cannon, the abandonment of wings taking flight. Thank you guys.